This episode of Ticket Volume is brought to you by us, Invigate. Get service operations under control in no time. Get one free month of our software solution by going to try.invigate.com. Ticket Volume is happy to bring you the past president of the Institute of Service Management, contributor to service management and project management standards and publications. He's a member of the SFIA or SOFIA Council and the Global Design Authority for SOFIA. An internationally recognized thought leader, SFIA or SOFIA accredited consultant, assessor, and trainer, Matthew works with companies and governments to improve digital skills management maturity. Welcome to Ticket Volume, news and information for improving IT experiences. I'm your host, Matt Barron, and each week I get the pleasure of speaking with different leaders to share insights on service management technology, how we do business, and so much more. This episode is not going to change. I hope you're having a great day. I also hope that you leave a comment, connect with us, or share our podcast with someone. Get involved. Get us improving. Now let's begin. Welcome, Matthew Burroughs, to Ticket Volume. Thank you very much, Matt. It's great to be here. Nice to talk to you again. Likewise, likewise. I, I realized when I was scheduling this with you that the last time we spoke, you were kind of starting off your journey with SFIA and that accreditation um, standard. So that's an obvious place for us to start. Um, what, what is SFIA or SOFIA and, and what prompted its creation? Yeah, good question. The SOFIA, the Skills Framework for the Information Age, doesn't exactly say what it is, but the, the, the best way to sort of describe it is it's a common language for describing skills and competencies in the digital IT, software engineering, project management, business analysis, all IT and technology related skills and competencies. So it's just a set of standard descriptions and we need that really because otherwise we spend time arguing over definitions and descriptions and we misunderstand each other. So that's the simplest way to think about it is, is a common language. And I, I guess if I expand on that a little bit, the, I, I liken it to navigation. You know, if you want to meet me some, want me to go and meet you somewhere, you're going to use the standard naming conventions of the city, uh, the street, the building name. Um, we're going to use maps, whether they're physical maps or they're on, a, on our phone or whatever it might be. But you're not going to say to me, oh, meet me in the orange building next to where I had coffee last Thursday. I have no idea where we had coffee last Thursday. Sophia does equivalent of the maps, the naming conventions. Just gives us common language means we can all understand each other. Yeah. So when someone says I'm incident management accredited level three, like, you know what that means, you know what I'm capable of. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Because there's a definition, it, it's a little bit more detailed than that, I guess, but yeah, because the description in Sophia describes what you do. And of course you can have that at different levels. You could just know the theory behind that and have knowledge, you could have put that knowledge into practice in a working environment and become proficient, or you could have taken it the full way and you've done it so many times over such a long extended period of time, you're fully professionally competent. So we call that competency. So yeah, the, the Sophia gives the description and then we've got ways of determining to what level do you have that capability or that experience. Well, I just want to take a moment and thank you for all of your efforts putting this together. I, I think it is um, revolutionary. I, I see the, the 10 years that have passed between the last time we spoke and, and now. Well, how is and it I that just long? see. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the last the time is, you were on a podcast yeah, maybe, with me anyway. <laughs> maybe, yeah. Um, and and I, I think about how, how impactful this can be for our community and for our people. And, and it's no small effort, right? And it's very altruistic to think, you know, this is something that we can give to people as a framework. You can see it being extremely pivotal for recruiters, mm. managers, and the people who, who gain skills from experience and don't 
like to take the certification and don't learn well in a, in a classroom environment. Yeah, absolutely. It's used in so many different ways. And, and I guess the thing with Sophia is it's been around for over 20 years. It's regularly updated. Um, we're currently on version eight, but we're already talking about version nine, which will be released sometime 2024, late 2024. So we have a new major version roughly every three years because guess what? Things change. You know, 10 years ago, when I last spoke to you on the podcast, I know the version of Sophia we had at the time probably didn't major much on digital uh, forensics or data science or various other things. Those skills weren't really understood, known, talked about a long time ago. So I guess that, that's another thing that everybody's finding difference between now and 10 years, 20 years ago. The rate of change is much more rapid. And that's exactly true with our skills and competencies. I think it's Gartner who estimated that the skills and competencies in a job description change roughly 10% every year. And you, you must have worked in organizations, you know, 10 years ago where they wrote a job description and they did nothing with it for five or six years, expecting it to stay the same. That just doesn't happen now. So. And the same is true when we talk about our own skills, we can develop new skills because of the project we've just finished last week or the sprint we were on a couple of weeks ago or, or that task we did this morning, you know, it, so th it changes and we need to be able to keep up with those changes. So an easy way of changing our skill profile, changing the role profiles, using it in recruitment, whatever we use it in. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. And then professionally now you're, you're with skills TX. You're, you're part of this organization that I, I think partners with that framework basically to then deliver training and, and certification. Is that right? Yeah, we, we set up skills TX. I'm one of, one of the founders. Um, it was really as a result of doing the 20 plus years of Sophia consulting work that I've done. And, you know, I've, got a background in IT service management, project program management, you know, but I've always sort of veered towards the people and process side of things rather than the detailed technology. And I think that's something that, that people are starting to realize that no matter how clever we are with the technology, you know, we talk about chat GPT and AI and machine learning and all that stuff, no matter how clever we are with that, actually, we still need people with the right skills and competencies to do all of that stuff, design it, gather the requirements, build it, maintain it, support it, whatever. So actually more than ever, I would argue, we are in the people business and th that isn't going away anytime soon. Sure, the balance will change between how much is automated, which activities we do compared with what's automated or done by a computer, but we'll still, still need people and we'll still need co uh, skills and competencies for a long time. Yeah. Exactly. This is part of the work that will never really go away. That hmm. what you need, what you know, how you know how to apply it, and what value you provide just continues to be relevant, no matter what. And if you're playing the bingo card game, he already said Gardner, so you got to fill that card. <laughs> <laughs> what what other ones have I got to mention? I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. need to, I need to just take a note and tick them off as I go along. Chat GPT is right in the middle. It's the free one. Everyone talks about it. Um, and so like, that's a huge trend right now. So what do you think, like wh when you think about what, what that brings to, to our business and to organizations and, and to mm -hmm. people's lives, what do you think ab about that impact? Because you're obviously in this space where you're, people are trying to be relevant sure. through trainings and skills. How does it impact people? Well, um, I do see a difference in a number of places. So first thing I'm seeing obviously is people's job descriptions changing to include skills that include training AIs and bots and designing them. And, you know, there's a subtly different set of skills that they need to, to design and create and manage those. So on that level, I see the change, but also I'm seeing people trying to use that to, um, do some of the stuff we perhaps would have done manually. Um, I'll mm. give you an example. I, I, I went to chat GPT a few weeks ago and said, right. Okay. Um, I'm always writing job descriptions and mapping them to Sophia. Um, and I set it an exercise that I set for my students in, in one of my Sophia classes, you know, tell me what skills you would need 
as a business analyst. And I gave a description of what they did. And I said, I want you to give me the Sophia 8, version 8 skills, which levels, and um, you know, profile that role. And it came back with some, on the surface, pretty you know, reasonable answers. But then when you scratch the surface, it had made up some skills that don't exist in Sophia. It had even made up some of the four letter short codes that we use in Sophia, but brand new ones that don't exist. Um, and then when I corrected it and said, she, that, that, that skill doesn't exist. It's, oh, sorry, I shouldn't have mentioned that. And then in the same conversation later, it brought up the same skill again. And I pointed out and it said, oh, I shouldn't have mentioned that. And then lied to me and said, um, I never suggested that skill. It's like, yes, you did. It's in the, <laughs> it's in the chat. So caution, caution, you know, I, the, I guess in the immediate term, you might get it to do some background work for you, suggest a profile, but you still got to, what do they call it? Human in the loop. You, you've still mm. got to have somebody knowledgeable to say, hold on a minute. You just made that bit up or that's wrong. It hasn't got to that point, but I'm sure it'll improve. And that might take the drudgery out of some of the work that we do. So there's a couple of levels there to think about, but it yeah, certainly is going to have an impact, um, but all new technologies do. And that's why we have to update the skill framework to describe the difference in those skills and competencies. Yes. Yes. And this new information age, you know, it's when, it, when I think about skills TX and I think about Sophia, the framework or, or even any framework or any certification schema. Yeah, there's always, I always want to be able to own it myself. I always want to be yes. able to, to be self-sufficient. And it, to me, part of it is about accessibility. Like, can, can I, as an individual afford to become accredited? So yeah. it, is that something that you, you guys run into? What do you do to keep this well, stuff affordable and accessible? Yeah, <laughs> I think that's probably the bit of the journey I didn't expand on when you asked me about skills TX, because. Yeah, we, we did, we used to do lots of consulting work and, you know, a, a, an organization call us in and say, you're the experts in Sophia, come and do it for us, with us, you know, very heavy on the consulting. Actually, do, do you know what, that having an ongoing dependency on a group of consultants is not a healthy thing and not something that I think people should do, particularly when you look at skills and competencies, because it's almost a core competency in itself that every organization has got to have. You know, as individual IT technology professionals, whatever we think of ourselves as individual professionals, we have got to take some ownership for our own skills, because even if we're working for an employer, at the end of the day, we take our skills home with us. If we leave that employer and go somewhere else, we take our skills with us. So we loan them to our employer. And these days, people don't stay with the same employer for 20, 30, 40 years. They tend to move around the, with the gig economy. You know, people might even be just employed for a single sprint or an individual task or a day. So actually, as professionals, we need to take a bit of ownership of our professional profile. And the best way to express what our skills and competencies are is to use an internationally accepted framework like Sophia, which is used in nearly 200 countries around the world. Um, and here's my digital skill wallet, or here's my digital CV or resume or whatever you want to, might want to call it. So we, in the reason we created skills TX was because when we did those projects, people said to us, you know, that tool you use to help us assess our skills and build the role profiles and do all those things. Could we carry on using that after the project? It was like, yeah, of course you can. And we. And that's where we turned our internal tool into really, it, we gave it a name, Skills TX, um, you know, and, and made it available to the customers. And we've got customers that take no consulting, no training. They just buy the SaaS licenses and it's all there. You can use it yourself. You know, I could send you a link and you could do your own self-assessment in somewhere between 10 minutes and an hour, depending on how many skills you have. That's a one-off activity. It gives you your baseline skill profile. You then just need to keep it up to date whenever your skills change. And the same thing with employers, the skills TX tool will help them do all the other things. So they can be self-sufficient. They can have that capability themselves and not have a need to go out to any consultants. Of course, they might, they might be time poor and say, actually, we could do with a consultant for a few days to help us 
map our job descriptions or something. That option's always there, but actually it removes a barrier. You, you know, if you can give people a, a, a tool that's, you know, SaaS based tool, very reasonable, you know, easy to use, do it yourself. Easy. Yeah. Exactly. That's empowerment. That's enablement. I, I noticed it right away when I signed up for a skills. You said skills sticks. Skills TX. It was probably just my uh, tripping over my oh, okay. teeth or something. Okay. You know. Just, just, just yeah. make it. Because if it's pronounced a different way, I want to get it right. Um, no, no. But when I signed up for me. a skills TX profile, it right away it was like, okay, let's go through this interview process. And it starts asking questions like right away. It's part of the onboarding even. Like how yeah. do you do d digital maturity skills assessments and um, I really like that. I really like that it gets you in right away. It just sort of like, it makes it accessible. Yeah. You can start the other thing, away. There's no barrier. It's the, that's the yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. So the, the other thing I really want to pick your brain on, because you're, you're, uh, you're an educator and a thought leader in the space. And so you think about how people learn. You think about knowledge and how people take skills and competence and apply mm -hmm. it every day. How do you think about those things? Like, do you think about like, you know, what, what is the pedagogical, um, thinking around knowledge and applied learning? Well, first of all, I see what we've done wrong over the last couple of decades. And I'm sure you've had this situation. You, you let's stick to IT service management, right? It's an area we know. So you send somebody yep. on a foundation level course, you know, maybe ITIL foundation or whatever your flavor of choice is for, for your framework, but you send them on a foundational course, they come back into the organization. You say, great, you've got your training certificate. You're now in charge of this implementation. We want you to implement a problem management function or something. Now that is problematic. Because it would be the equivalent of you taking your teenage child, um, who has maybe got five hours experience on a games console, playing Forza and driving a car, has never actually really driven a car. Um, you give them the keys, you pack the car with all of your family, all of your loved ones, and you say, what could possibly go wrong? You know, you know, in theory, you know, that's a steering wheel. You know, you know that, you know, the pedals do something, go set off on a 500 mile journey. What could possibly go wrong? You just wouldn't do it. And we do that in the IT world all the time. They go on the equivalent, it, it, stick with the driving analogy. It's the equivalent of the, what we call in the UK, the highway code, the, the theory exam. So if you go and learn the theory. And you sit a multiple choice or multiple guess um, exam, and you get enough points, you have your certificate to say you understand the theory. You are not the best driver in the world. You may never have driven at all. You understand the theoretical rules of the road, road and how it works. So in, in our terminology, we call that knowledge. And, and that, that comes from the ISO um, standards on how you assess people, right? It, I've not made this stuff up. It, it's got good pedigree, good foundation. That's knowledge. That is great. And that is often the starting point for people. They start with going and learning the knowledge, but they yeah. do not have their driving license at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They have a certificate saying they passed the theory. They then go and sit next to an experienced driver and drive a car, but the experienced driver, the instructor is there to make sure you don't do anything stupid and kill yourself or somebody else by, by making a mistake. They can take over. That's the equivalent of maybe putting that person from the foundation course next to someone to shadow them or to get some coaching and support. It's mitigating the risk that we have while they practice the theory that they have and become proficient in doing They actually do what we describe. Yeah. And eventually they'll get to the point where the instructor says, do you know what? I think you're safe enough. You're proficient enough that you could be trusted on your own. I'm going to, you can, you can go for your driving test now. Um, an examiner will, will run you through a load of exercises, satisfy themselves that you're safe and hopefully you pass. You then get given the keys. You are proficient. 
you are not the best driver in the world. You've nowhere, you're nowhere near that professional level. You might think you are, you're not. So you need to carry on driving. And as you drive more, you become more proficient. And you may even get to the stage where you've driven enough um, that you've reached the equivalent of full professional competency. And that's what we need to have a difference in, in our industry. Because if I'm interviewing someone, I may be able to accept just the theoretical knowledge and it's low risk, that particular activity. So it doesn't matter if they learn on the job, trial and error, that's okay. But, but for some activities, it's going to be much more critical. And actually, I'm going to need someone with solid experience who's going to get it right every time or the majority of the time. So we need to recognize that difference because our industry is too based on training certificates, which just indicate the theory, the knowledge, and they don't yet recognize that distinction widely enough to proficiency and then to full competency. Wow. Wow. Great metaphor. I'm totally biased because my daughter is going through driver's education right now. She's got her permit and I'm, I'm the experienced master next to her, just trying to keep my comments to a minimum. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. We've, we've, a lot of us have been through it and, uh, and we were yeah. there once, weren't we? You know, we, we were the ones doing the learning. Um, and you're, you nailed it. Now you're passing you said, on you know, you, yourself. You think you're the master but you really are not even that proficient. You're not, you're just a beginner. You're a little newbie. Um, and what, how powerful would that be to be able to shadow someone in that role? I think about some of the more complex processes like configuration management or continual service mm. improvement that really take a lot of um, experience and understanding to get right without feeling like you're failing all the time. <laughs> well, do you, do you remember, I mean, you must have come across the 70-20-10 model, right? Do you remember that classic no. triangle that they show in trainings? So, um, 10% of your development is formal, off-the-job learning, training. 20% is near the job, so the equivalent of shadowing, mentoring, coaching, close supervision. And 70% of it is on the job experience doing it. Now, our, each of us, our development plans should bear some resemblance to those proportions. So yes, our development plan should include going on training courses or doing self-study, reading the books, whatever it might be, learn the theory, learn the knowledge. But then our training and development plan should also have activities that say, apply that knowledge, you know, whether that's secondment across to a project shadowing somebody else, some mentoring, coaching, just more hands-on experience, whatever it might be, those actions should be in our development plan and everybody mm -hmm. should have a development plan because even if you don't want to develop new skills, you still need to practice your current skills and keep them up to date. Otherwise, they will go out of date and they will go away. So everybody needs a skill profile saying where they are a development plan saying what actions they're taking to keep their skills up to date or to develop the new ones they need. You need that throughout your career, whether you're starting in college or you're reaching the end and you're actually documenting some of the skills that you're passing on to other people by being a mentor. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why those CPDs exist. That's why we want the, the accreditations. They try to, you know, stay on top of that. How are you applying this? Or you know, you're doing it in a practical way. Here's the experience yeah. I have recently. And, you know, yeah, you doesn't can get have to be academic, or you can be doing the work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It doesn't have to be academic. And that's another thing that's changed. Recognizing that actually experience is important. And you, you might not have been to university. You might not have got all, this, all of the letters after your name. But if you've got the experience of doing it, you, you need recognition for that experience. That's really valuable. It's what people often lack. Yes. Yes. And there's, there's room for everyone. Like uh, yeah. there are like, let's get some of those people with a thousand acronyms after their name, because it's really interesting to talk to those people. They really sure. understand theory to another level. And then there are people who don't have any of the theory, but really just do this every day. Super yeah. useful too. Yeah. Um, so S Sophia, let's get into the details of Sophia. Sure. Is there such a thing as like a standard? Because I want people to know without having to Google, is there an incident management Sophia accreditation? 
Yeah, there, there is. Um, I mean, the first thing to say is that in Sophia, there's 121 professional skills in the framework, and they're described at one or more of the seven levels that we have in, in the framework. But that's not the only piece. We don't just cover all of those skills. One of those skills is instant management, right? But you'll find capacity management, config, you'll find things that are not very service management related, digital forensics, information security, even teaching, performance management, uh, relationship management, you know, uh, even sales and marketing skills in there, anything that's technology related. Um, so there's those, those skills, but there's another important part of Sophia, which is what we call the generic levels of responsibility characteristics or attributes where it, these are sometimes thought of and described as behavioral factors. Some people refer to them as soft skills, but we know through mm. experience that they're, they're not soft, they're hard to acquire. And, and what they describe is autonomy, influence, complexity, knowledge, and business skills. So that includes lots of things, you know, communication, how good are you at team working and interacting with other people, influencing people, um, you know, all of those things that are one really important part to balance against the professional skills. Because you could have a professional skill, you could be the best enterprise architect in the world and have the enterprise architecture skill at level six, but your communication skills are not very good. So you're not very good at communicating that architecture to the people that need to understand it. So those things go together. Um, so yes, you could get badged. You could get a digital credential or a, a badge um, as a Sophia accredited assessor, I could sit down with you. You could tell me about your experience. I could listen and I could say, eh, it sounds like knowledge to me. It's just theory. There's no, no evidence of him doing it in real, real practical working environment. So I might just give you a knowledge badge. Or if I can see you're proficient at it, I can give you a proficiency badge or I can give you a competency badge. So, and, and, and it could be for any of the levels. So instant management is a really good example. It's got descriptions at levels two, three, four, and five. So level two, you're answering the phone, logging, classifying an instant. Next level up, you might be gathering data to try and diagnose. Next one up, you might be implementing a workaround. Level five, you might be making sure people are following the process and that things are being done. So maybe a service desk manager might be practicing that skill more at level five. And a junior service desk analyst might be more at level two, maybe a bit of level three. And you, you can then see how Sophia is used for career progression, but you can also see how it's used to describe the roles in an organization because in a large organization, that service desk manager will only ever need to practice it at five because they've got such a large organization. They'll never need to roll their sleeves up and answer the phone and log and classify. But in a small organization, they might, right? It's busy. The services manager picks up the phone, logs the case himself. That services manager, therefore, is practicing that skill at level two. But in an hour's time, he might be back supervising someone and practicing at level five. So their profile might have that skill at level two, three, four, and five. And they could be accredited and badged for each of the levels at which they have the skill. Yep. So you get the idea. You know, it's, it, it, it is slightly more complicated than just saying, Yep, you've got instant management, yes or no. It doesn't quite work like that. So as long as we recognize instant management happens at different levels um, and there's a difference between knowledge, proficiency, and competency, then if I show you an instant management level five competency badge, I know exactly what that means and the rest of the world knows exactly what that means. It means you've not only got the knowledge, you've not only become proficient, but you've taken it all the way to the end of the development and you're fully professionally competent at level five, which means you can supervise other people, run the process, agree the policies, all of the other things that we describe in Sophia in that skill at that level. And when I, when I've got you in front of me for a job vacancy and I'm, rec I'm interviewing you, that tells me something. And maybe the person next to them has just got their own resume or CV that they've written and it's them telling you there's no independent validation or verification of that. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I would say that this, this badge is going to help that person get that job. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a way to differentiate yourself as an employee. Yeah, and an important thing, really important at the moment when, when the, yeah, let's face it, technology has become so much more critical to most organizations. You, how many times you go to the press and, and, and see um, companies having made a, had a data breach um, and that data breach being caused by somebody who should have known that they needed to patch the servers and didn't do it? Or was it caused by the person who should have written the policy to say you will patch the servers on a regular basis? Or was it the doing level? So which level? I could pick out, I could go and assess that organization, see the gap in Sophia terms and say, oh, you've got a gap in level six. Have you, have you set your policies? Because that, that suggests to me you probably haven't got anybody setting the policies for other people to follow. And that could cause you a problem. So most of the technology failures we find, there's a people and skills related issue behind it. Wow. wow. We're going to turn this into the learning and development episode. It's amazing to think <laughs> about Be because of course, like we can blame the technology and we can blame the people, oh. but really it's a gap in, in applied knowledge. It is, or, or, you know, people given that responsibility, whereas if it's clear mm -hmm. in their job description, actually you have to do your responsibility to do what Sophia's describing these five skills at level five and six, you know, exactly what you've got to do. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and if you aren't quite there with your experience, you can have that in your development plan. You know, it, it, it really is about people and skills, as I said before, and, and the, the technology just does what we ask it to do. Okay. So thinking closed loop, I'm, I'm, I've bought into Sophia, the framework, I'm a recruiter. I've got people on a learning and development plan for their, their skill levels. Can, can I take, um, maybe some of what I've learned at, at, at a higher level or a lower level and implement that into Sophia or contribute that back to Sophia? Yeah. Yes, you can. I mean, the first thing to say is that there's a, there's a few different things to think about. Some people are tempted to try and customize the Sophia framework itself. Now that's a bit like taking the map and crossing out bits and drawing on your own symbols. Nobody's going to understand it. Right? So I would advise against changing the framework itself because it defeats the object of having a standardized framework that everybody's working to. But that doesn't mean that it's rigid. It just means those descriptions and those names should stay the same. What mm. people do is they augment it. So they make it relevant to their organization. So as an example, there's a programming skill in Sophia. That programming skill will talk about the generic activity of writing code, testing it, you know, all of the, the activities, but it won't mention specific programming languages because there could be millions of them, right? So what we do is we allow people to, to attach what we call skill attributes to Sophia. So a next level of detail. So you would assess yourself using Sophia saying, I've got programming at level two, so I can write simple programs and scripts. I've got programming at level three proficiency. I can do moderately complex scripts. I can test and review other people's code. And I can do that specifically in Java, C++, and whatever, right? So yeah. the important thing is that because a lot of HR systems think they've got this sorted, they just go out and do a search and they pick up all of these individual terms and say, have you got a Java skill? Well, Java isn't a skill. Java is a technology. What mm -hmm. do you do with Java? Are mm -hmm. you actually coding in it? In which case the skill is programming. Or are you designing software, in which case the skill is software design? Or are you managing people writing it, in which case it might be system development management or project management? So it's really important that technologies, methodologies, frameworks, all those things are not skills. They are things related to skills. And Sophia gives you that piece that you can, you can attach those to and still make them relevant. So you know, that, that Java skill will appear as a skill attribute against multiple skills. And you can say, well, I've got programming in Java. So it gives you the whole thing and you're not deviating. You're not creating your own taxonomy, your own framework, your own descriptions, the Sophia foundation and everybody that uses it around the world and everybody can, that contributes to updating it, which anyone can, by the way, it's a, you know, it's, it's open 
anybody can submit ideas saying, I don't think Sophia covers this very well, um, and give ideas. So that's how we do new versions. That's what we do on the design authority board. Look at those reviews that come in and that we use those in the, in the updates. So anybody can, can contribute it, but. You don't have to customize the framework. You just need to make it relevant to your organization or your people by adding on those attributes, um, creating role profiles that are not just industry standard ones, but ones actually reflect how you work in your organization. So it's all about yeah. configuring it's such it. A good, it's such good it. advice. Yeah, yeah it, it makes your job easier. That's what it does. <laughs> you don't yeah, have to invent see, the wheel. But you see, in, in, in the technology world, sometimes it's out of our comfort zone. You know, mm. we, we can quite often be very comfortable with the technology because you prod a piece of technology and it gives you a predictable response. Mm -hmm. You know, I know how to set up that server. I know how to configure that database. It's known. It's comfortable for us. We're not always as comfortable when it comes to the people side because people will give you a different response depending on whether they had breakfast that morning whether they had a row with their other half, you know, if they had an argument, are they feeling upset? Are they too hot, too cold? You know, it's less predictable. And a lot of managers fear the unknown and they don't really know how to do this touchy-feely people and skills thing. So I'll try and avoid it and I'll just stick to the technology piece. And my message is you cannot avoid it. If mm. you avoid it, your people will leave and, and people leave organizations. There's a skill shortage, right? So there's great opportunity for technology people. If they, the, the number one reason why they leave, and this has been consistent for the last seven or eight years, number one reason is a lack of development opportunity. Yeah. Sometimes that's a real lack because there is no development opportunity. Sometimes it's just a perceived lack because you're not showing them what they could do to get better, to get that promotion to go into that area that they're really interested in. So actually open it up, deal with it head on, say to people, you probably got skills that I don't know about. Uh, you, definitely people are much more than their job description. So you want to know what interests them, their total picture of their skill, their skill profile. You then want to show them the opportunities based on, well, actually you already meet 60% of the criteria for this role. Well, I'd never thought about going into that type of environment, I could, that might be quite interesting. That's another opportunity. You're giving them the opportunities to grow. And if they see the opportunities with your company, they're more likely to stay. You'll hold on to the good ones. And that's really something people are struggling with. You cannot avoid it. You have to look after your people and do something about skills and competencies. The good news, it's not that it's not anywhere near as difficult as you think it's going to be. It's really mm -hmm. quite easy because we've been doing it for over 20 years. We sort of know how to do it. So actually it's really a lot more straightforward than you fear. So don't fear it. Just go into it, do it. You'll find it so much easier than you thought. You'll get it done in a short space of time and it will make everything easier. Yes. I love it. Mr. Burroughs focused on the outcomes, focused on the business value. I love it, my man. Where can people connect with you and learn more? Yeah. So probably start off with skillstx.com. Did I say it right that time? Skillstx.com. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've got a load of material on there that will tell people what Sophia is, uh, what you do with it, how do you get started. Um, if you're looking at it as an individual professional, you can even go on there and you can register like you did, Matt, you can, you can register and do your own skill profile, Sophia-based skill profile in under an hour. Um, if you're an organization, we've got this thing called the DSMM, Digital Skills Management Maturity Assessment. Again, completely free. If you go to skillstx.com, you've got a simple form to fill in. You press the button, it sends you a survey, which you do in the browser, it takes you about 10 to 15 minutes. It'll tell you what your organization's good at and bad at. Where are you in terms of being able to do the skills and competencies piece? And it will give you advice on how to take that next step to get, get to where you want to be, where you need to be, and lots of other useful material. You can, from that report, you can build the business case internally. You can have that discussion with your colleagues and you can get started. 
Yeah, exactly. Good advice. I know if you take those uh, assessments that you'll probably come off with some ideas of where you need to improve too, right? Yeah. So thanks for your time. Thanks for being on Ticket Volume, Mr. Burroughs. No problem. My pleasure. Lovely to talk to you again. Likewise. And for our audience, did you know that you can join us for a live recording? Register today at TicketVolume.com and click on register. Thank you for listening. You can change this podcast and improve it by DMing us, leaving a comment. And speaking of ticket volume, did you know that this podcast is brought to you by Invigate, a fit-for-purpose service desk solution with integrated asset management designed to let you focus on supporting your organization without arduous implementations. In fact, IT teams from Toyota, NASA, and McDonald's use Invigate to manage requests, automate workflows, and centralize inventory data so that they can focus on delivering better service. Because good service is good business.